the history of the Necrons. It was during the last days of the war in heaven that the doom of the Inga came upon them. It was not a sudden thing, this storm whose wrath was to break upon the elder deities, whose violence was to enfold them, shatter them into broken shards and cast them evermore into shackles beneath the lowliest of things. Perhaps if they had been more watchful, the gods would have seen and halted what came next while the storm still gathered, while the winds of fate were rising. Perhaps they would have remained divine. Yet we of the tribes of Eldenesh and Ulthanash, we know better than any how pride may lay even gods low. So it was with the Inga. Long the war in heaven raged. In some tales its dawning came with the first rays of the stars themselves, as the shadow that needs must be cast alongside the light. In others it was a fire, the hungry and knowing flame that spread through the veins and arteries of the void and wrought all that it touched unto blackened ash. Alternative myths tell of the war as an ogre, both petty and unworthy, the changeling child of ambition, bred of jealousy and spite that soon outgrow those who birthed it and sought to devour them all. Insatiable was the hunger of that first and greatest war. It burned worlds, crushed them to dust in its unmerciful grip and ground them to ruin with its cavernous maw. It left untold destruction in its wake, and through the ruin the Inga came dancing. Had they heard the music of endless slaughter, and come to bring the performance to its crescendo? Did the Necrontar uh, call upon them in their despair, and so invite across the threshold that which would both save and damn them? Was it all but a horrible chance? First did Mephit Ran bring his offer of kinship, the deceiver singing poisoned promises from a silver-gilt tongue. To all the silent king listened and gave his blessing. Then came the days of dark sacrifice, the soul spend, the time of reaper's plenty, when the ghost arcs prowled, the unwilling screamed for mercy, and then the uncaring furnaces roared with the Ogrier's voice. There was death, and there was life's cold echo. Then there came a time when the Ogri walked the blood roads between the stars in manifold guises, and the glittering hordes marched upon the fastness eternal, while the Yngir soared on high. The labyrinth was flayed bare, its twisting ways trammelled, and its secrets turned back upon those who first had whispered them. The old ones perished in that terrible age. The Inga drank deep of their potent souls, and then did they blaze like darkling stars. Yet the storm was rising. Already the banshee's vengeful keening carried upon the bloodied winds. The Ogir had feasted unto satiation. The fire, still raging hot and high, had burned all which might sustain it. In their moment of surpassing triumph, the Inga were vulnerable, for they had given much of themselves to at last cast down their age-old foes. They did not grasp the depths of loathing that their tainted gifts had conjured. About them, they saw only slaves, savage and simple beings content to feed the dying fires. They should instead have seen blades, each wrought from a billion pinpricks of starlight, yet no less sharp for their fractured form. They should have seen the doom that they had fashioned from their own cunning cruelty. The Inga had promised allegiance, then demanded worship. Now they would know retribution fit to shake the stars from their heavens and cast them blazing from the skies like the tears of Aisha. The blows fell swift and terrible as, at last, the storm broke. 
Upon the Chimeric Way, they fell upon Asgurud, the Nightbringer, that which the Eldari knew as Kelishra, fear in corporeal form, who sowed the fields of nightmare, whose shadow loom long in mortal thoughts and entwined eternal with death's embrace. With the eye of Kathantar, they set the gaze of the celestial many upon Azagurud, and in so doing did they burn away the shadows that coiled about it. Sudden was its sundering, cataclysmic its demise, and the shards of its shattered form fell glinting into the void. So fell Azagurud, the Nightbringer. Mephet ran, at first come before the Necrontier, as emissary, as oaf-singer, as a fashioner of falsehood. The deceiver it was, and a thousand echoed whisper names besides. For so woven was falsehood into its fabric, that even Mephet ran knew not where its own truth began, and its lies found their end. Amidst the maze of endless beginnings did its doom come upon it, for the slighted servants brought to life the singing spheres, and by their song was the ing air wrought apart. So fell Mephet ran, the deceiver. Greatest and most terrible of all the Catan was Magladroth, the font of immortality, the forge of substance, that which was known as the dragon. Yet about Magladroth's neck had hung the talismans of Vol, and by the light that spilled from within them had a secret weakness been revealed. Broken too fell the dragon by the hand of the Ogri, and the crimson glow of the prison sepiternal. Thus lay his work unfinished evermore. So fell Magladroth the dragon. Most reviled by the unspeaking lord was Lashudra, that which birthed in the minds of mortals the sickness everlasting, that which walked always three steps behind, which saw through the eyes of all that was the named as the endless swarm. The sorrow of the void it was that brought Lashudra to the mortal brink and severed its bonds beyond sight, in its breaking with a thousand tides of misery released upon the stars, yet in its casket at last it lay. So fell Lashudra, the endless swarm. The mirth of all cruel things was Nadra Zetha, who was called the Burning One, the immolating glee and the breath of the infinite pit. All things were its kindling, for its will was the searing that blackened the strands of eons, and its ravenous touch no thing of the real nor the echo realm might endure. It was the pyre of the labyrinth, the torch of the ziggurats lost, the reaping winds of ember blight. How came that thing unto its end no record speaks, but that a single etching upon a single wall upon a single world shows the silent lord himself laying the spear unto its molten heart. So fell Niadra Zatha, the burning one. Once again, the storm could not be stayed, the scythe's reaping arc could not be halted, the Ogrier's last rampage could not be held at bay, as though the stars themselves were wrapped in the velvet veil of the void's last morning, so the Ingar, one by one, were laid low, and their poisoned lights extinguished evermore. They fell, and in their falling changed all that was real. In their millions did the risen slaves fall upon Lander Gore, the flayer, the lidless eye, and with the blades unforged they extinguished all that he was. So was his last curse loosed upon his slayers. They knew not what they wrought, but it was vengeance, yet all pay the price even still. The outsider, Tessera Noga, had fallen already to the trickery of the laughing god, yet in its madness had it become terrible indeed. None could slay it, for its terror was too great to endure. Some tell that the outsider rent itself asunder and was taken in its turn. 
Others warn that no prison ever trammelled it, that it alone of the Ingar never fell, and that one day it will return. Kalyugura, the silent cry, was entombed eternally upon the word of the unspeaking. Yegrenaya, moulder of worlds, was bound, twisted and broken asunder by its own cosmic powers. Thysak Ilya, the walking blight, the shadow that withers worlds, was lured through the inevitable gateway and broken within the void beyond. So ended that which cannot end. As the mirror struck by the grieving fist of sorrow, as the web that in its spinning so unwinds its strands, the Inga were broken and rent, and into shards they fell. Yet theirs was the fire undying, the weft of the tapestry eternal, that which always is. They did not pass beyond, but rather lingered as a scream whose echoes fracture and fracture again, each portion but a stunted repetition of all that gave that first cry life, repeating endlessly, purposelessly, yet roared and powerful still. Even broken and debased, the Inga had not suffered enough. In tesseract shackles and fractural oubliettes, were they bound, in the white heat of hate were their chains wrought, and cold as the void they were as they wound about the shattered echoes of the gods that came before. Fundamental and eternal rolled the waves of ruin across the starlit void, for, as the Yinga were broken, so too was reality itself. Yet the Necrontaire cared nothing for the harm they wrought. Slaves had become masters, and masters enslaved would do unto the last days of the Rana Dandra and beyond. Extract from Eldari Law, the Book of Mournful Nights, the Dirge of Stars Extinguished. The Necrons are feared across the Imperium and beyond as a race of seemingly immortal android warriors. Dark rumours circulate of ancient tomb complexes, rising from beneath the surfaces of settled worlds, of ominous invasion fleets sweeping down from on high, and of inexorable armies crushing all beneath their metallic tread. Yet the Necrons were not always thus. Most of the galaxy's sentient races know the Necrons only as the terrifying beings they are now. Indeed, it took the Imperium of Mankind many centuries even to recognise them as a coherent Xenos race. The Necrons' ruling nobility were clearly seen to be sentient and ferociously intelligent. However, few amongst them have made any efforts to elaborate upon their origins or motivations to what they consider to be the lesser races. They have simply exterminated them. Yet hints exist even now in deeply buried xeno-archaeological remnants, in the long memories and hidden lore of the Aldari, and in the communalities of primitive artwork and tribal mythologies, of a race very different to the Necrons known and feared in the 41st millennium. Once, the legends suggest, the Necrons were a flesh-and-blood race known as the necron Short-lived and warlike, these beings were obsessed with death and for all their wondrous technologies and star-spanning empire, were in fact quarrelsome and fractious. Legends tell that, desperate to unite their people, the Necrons' rulers began a war with the beings known as the Old Ones. It was a war over the secrets of immortality, and also a war that the Necron Terre could never win. If cogent details of this war in heaven still exist, they do so only in the memories of the Necrons themselves. However, Eldar lore suggests that the Old Ones were the creators of the Webway, the arterial network of ethereal tunnels that still spans the interstices between the warp and real space. Using the Webway, the Old Ones drove the Necrontier back on every front. It was in the Necrontier's darkest hour during the reign of Zarak, last of the Silent Kings, that the Catan, those called the Yingir, came before the Necrontier with an offer of aid. The legends speak of ancient star gods being formed from the fundamental energies of the universe, 
who offered Zirak and his people all they had ever desired, power and immortality. All it would cost was for the Necrontyr to ally themselves with the Catan to destroy the hated Old Ones forever. Zirak deliberated long, but in the end he accepted the offer. In so doing, he damned his entire race. Fragments of lore describe what followed, the nightmare process of biotransference that placed the minds of the Necron Tear into living metal bodies and transformed them into the Necrons. The price was their souls, devoured by the leering Catan and, for all but those of the ruling castes, uh, the obliteration of almost all personality and free will. No more would the Necrons war and politic with one another, for their wills were bound to Zarak's control through cast iron command protocols, yet the cost of this unity had been monstrous indeed. The legends continue, scattered fragments telling of the defeat of the Old Ones and of how, in the moment when the Catan were at their weakest following that titanic conflict, the Necrons took their revenge and shattered the duplicitous star gods. They describe how Zarak saw that his people's time was done, for they could not face the Old One's vengeful servants, the Eldar chief amongst them. It is said that the Silent King commanded his people to inter themselves within the stasis crypts of their tomb cities, there to sleep out the eons until they could rise again to conquer all. Finally, destroying his command protocols and freeing his race, Zarak took his ship into the intergalactic void, to seek whatever solace he might amongst the empty darkness. The Necrons have slept for sixty million years, if the Eldar Book of Mournful Night is to be believed. Now they are waking at last, rising up to take back what was once theirs, and the galaxy trembles before them. The technologies that facilitate the great sleep was so far beyond human comprehension that they might as well have been sorcery. Hyper-intelligent master programs and legions of kineptic slave constructs watched over the Necron tombs as the ages crept past. Despite all this, manifold disasters beset the slumbering Xenos. Some tomb worlds were plundered by lesser races or purposefully purged by the vengeful Eldar. Others faced cascade failures in their stasis crypts, were obliterated by stellar catastrophe or comet strike, or endured such violent tectonic shifts that entire tombs were flooded with molten lava. Even those worlds that survived ended up far from their original positions, scattering the dynastic territories of old and leaving the Necrons fragmented and factionalised. The chronostats of many tomb worlds slipped due to mechanical failure or empiric distortion. Thus, rather than rising up as one across the galaxy, the Necrons have awoken piecemeal. Some emerged from stasis during the days of the Emperor's Great Crusade, while many others slumber still. Nor have the Necrons themselves come through the process unchanged. Corruption has crept into the minds of many, either during the passing of ages or while enduring the slow and unsettling process of revivication. Nihilistic madness or mindless stupor, claim some, while personality engrams of others have been distorted by countless subtle derangements. For all this, many billions of Necrons have already awoken, and trillions more stir. Their noble leaders might, in many cases, be mad, uh, but they have lost none of their arrogant sense of superiority, nor their desire for conquest. Every overlord and pharaon has their own agenda, be it to stockpile and fortify, to raid and destabilise, to send forth imperious envoys, or to begin omnicidal purges of non-Necron life. To other races, the Necron's behaviour seems random to the point of insanity, yet in truth most are working towards the same core goals – reconquer the stars they once ruled, and restore to glory whichever dynasty they once belonged to. From their earliest days, the rulers of the individual Necrontire dynasties were said to have been governed by the Triarch, a council of free pharaons. The head of the Triarch was known as the Silent King, addressing his subjects only through the other two pharaons, 
who counselled him and ruled at his side. It was the Triarch who set the codes by which the dynasties were expected to conduct their political and military endeavours. However, it was their Triarch Praetorians who were charged with enforcing those codes and ensuring the continuation of the dynasties and the Necrontar Empire itself. By the cataclysmic end of the war in heaven, the Praetorians judged themselves to have failed in their duty. It is for this reason that they have eschewed the great sleep, instead retreating into the shadows to preserve what they could of the Necrons' lore and culture, watching over the slumbering tomb worlds until the day their people would rise up once again. Most Necron nobles are still traditionalists, cleaving to ancient social and martial forms, they impose rigid hierarchies on their underlings and order and deploy their legions in accordance with, or defiance of, the codes of the Triarch that once governed them all. Most importantly, they still fight for their ancient dynasties. Sutek, Mafrit, Nahalek, and Ogdebuk. These and countless other dynasties make up the splintered Necron race. All are technically united in subservience to the rule of the Silent King. In truth, many believe themselves as far above their rival dynasties as all Necron nobles believe their species above the lesser races. Dynasties are as likely to fall into conflict as the ally, and countless smaller dynasties have been subsumed into the territories of larger and more powerful conquerors. For all this, more Necrons awaken all the time. As their numbers grow, so too do the dire threat they pose to the galaxy. Now, Zarek, last of the Silent Kings, has returned and seeks to unite his people in galactic conquest again. Whispers precede him of a diabolical plan to negate the galaxy-ending threat of chaos and subjugate the lesser races once and for all. With his enemies locked in a war of mutual annihilation and more Necrons rallying to his banner by the day, it uh, may already be too late for any to stop him. These names, I mean honestly. How is one, uh, how is a noble imperial servant such as myself supposed to say all these words correctly? They are ridiculous when transferred into imperial gothic. Anyway... Upon countless battlefronts across the galaxy, Necron armies are on the attack. Perceiving little distinction between the servants of the Emperor, the worshippers of the Dark Gods, or the teeming Xenos empires that surround them, imperious Necron nobles send forth their legions to reconquer their interstellar domains by whatever means necessary. The Necrons are best known and feared by their enemies for rising up from beneath their very feet. Countless civilizations have unknowingly settled on worlds that conceal Necron tomb complexes uh, deep beneath the surface. Whether triggered by Chronostat or the Tomb Master's program detecting intrusive life forms, those hidden sleepers awake. If the threat to the tomb complex is deemed significant, the Master program prioritizes revivification of Necron soldiery and war engines. It wields these assets to the best of its ability employing their might to augment that of its kineptic slave constructs in defending the tomb. Only when the Necron nobility awake to once again take command of their legions do they go on the offensive. In this moment, the doom of the world's flesh and blood colonists is sealed. The earth splits open in yawning fissures, and oceans drain away as the tomb complex rises inexorably to the surface. The sky darkens with seething swarms of kineptic scarabs, and the land glitters with the awakening legions as they advance into battle. Fortifications collapse as the ground heaves beneath them, and android killers claw their way out of the earth to trap their victims within the trespassers' own supposedly impregnable bastions. Should reinforcements rush to the aid of the beleaguered planet, they arrive to find the awakened tombs terrifying defences and mighty armies waiting for them. Thus are the lesser races slaughtered, and another tomb world secured in the battle for galactic dominance. Were this the only way in which the Necrons threaten the planets of the fledgling empires, it would be perilous enough. Yet time and again they descend from the heavens to conquer unweary worlds, sometimes appearing to step from thin air into the bloody heat of battle. Such 
feats are not the sorcery they might appear, but are rather due to the ingenuity of the cryptex. Part courtly vizier, part master engineers and part cosmic alchemist, the cryptex wield great influence within Necron society. They possess such a fundamental and far-reaching understanding of the universe's inner workings that, to the lesser races, their abilities appear as witchcraft. No single discipline do the cryptex pursue. Instead, each individual embarks on a course of obsessive study into whichever field of arcano-scientific law most fascinates them. Such decisions are based upon whim, aptitude, and often the obsessive madness caused by their long sleep. Often a cryptech will also select their field of expertise based on whatever they believe will render them most powerful within the Necron royal courts, and provide them with the most leverage over their rivals and noble masters. Plasmancers, for example, study the martial application of raw energy, they are aggressive warrior scientists whose bodies crawl with skeins of killing power and who can annihilate their victims with but a gesture. By comparison, uh, disciplines such as uh, psychomancy or chronomancy are far more subtle. The former plays upon the atavistic fears of all living things, while the latter allows the manipulation of the strings of time itself. There are countless other disciplines, from the master engineering skills of the Technomancers to the warping powers of the Gravmancers and the insidious abilities of the uh, Fenumbro... Fen Pen Penumbrancers. I don't know what that means. Cryptek are vital not only for their personal abilities, they also construct and maintain the eldritch technologies that allows their masters to launch their conquest in so many terrifying ways. Fleets of tomb ships are one such asset, their drives enabling them to bridge interstellar gulfs almost as quickly as warp travel, and in a significantly safer fashion. Terrifying sepulchral battleships of immense size, tomb ships can easily duel the greatest voidcraft of the lesser races, yet their greatest value is undoubtedly in spearheading Necron planetary conquests. Should even a single tomb ship settle in low orbit over an enemy world, it will deploy wave upon wave of war engines against its prey, even as its quantum wormhole technologies open the way for invading Necron foot soldiers to assail the enemy and their millions. Dolmen gates are another means of hyper-technological Necron invasion. They were first fashioned during the War in Heaven, when the Qatar, known as Niadra Zatha, the Burning One, gifted the Necrons with the means of their construction. These living stone arches trammel spars of the webway, allowing the Necrons the capability to travel through them. The metallic warriors must be swift, for even subjugated, the semi-sentient network resists and will destroy the Necrons if it can. Such risks prove worthwhile, however, Surprise is total when the lesser races find ancient, long-forgotten ruins flaring suddenly to life upon their worlds, and the deathless Necron legions marching from within. The Imperium of Man has but recently begun to understand the importance of what they call not to live, or more commonly, Blackstone. Abaddon the Despoiler grasped its power and importance far earlier than they, and employed that knowledge to apocalyptic ends. Yet the true masters of Blackstone are the Necrons, for they both understood and employed this substance millions of years before the lesser races even existed. Blackstone is so named because it is mined from smooth, dark deposits similar in appearance to onyx or obsidian. To the Imperium, the scientific readings that it gives off appear contradictory and bewildering. To the Necron cryptex, however, they make far more sense. Yet even humanity has been able to grasp the core property of this substance. Noctilif resonates with the energies of the Immaterium, and when properly polarised, either channels or repels them with tremendous force. While the lesser races fumble to comprehend the most basic truths of Noctilif, the Necrons work this powerful material into their war engines, their weaponry, and even into the immense megaliths known as pylons. 
The cryptics understand the techno-arcane secrets of the channeling of cosmic energies through Blackstone, which causes the substance to flare vivid colours, even as it produces weaponized energy beams, crackling portals or other effects beyond the ken of the Necron's foes. They employ it in the null-field matrices that shield their tomb worlds from hostile psychic manifestations, and, most recently, in the fashioning of experimental pylon arrays that may yet spell doom for all of the Necron's foes. The Necrons possess a technological base so far in advance of any of the galaxy's other inhabitants that only the artifice of the Eldar warrants even close comparison. This is perhaps unsurprising for a species whose very living forms are mechanical in nature. Certainly it seems natural enough to the Necron nobility themselves, for it supports their arrogant presumption of superiority over the despised lesser races. Most widespread of all the Necron's weapons of war is Gorse technology. From the man-made portable Gorse flayers borne by Necron warriors up to the massive Gorse flux arc, these weapons all function in the same fashion. They project a molecular disassembling beam that reduces flesh, armour and bone to their constituent atoms, one agonising layer at a time. Gorse is but one of the horrifying technologies the Necrons employ in battle. Tesla weaponry releases beams of living lightning that scorches and blasts victims, and can even arc from one foe to the other. Particle weapons work by emitting streams of minuscule antimatter particles. These detonate on contact with other matter, annihilating their targets in violent blasts. In metic weaponry, too, is as frightening as it is effective, for its thrumming pulses cause the target's atoms to be violently repelled from one another to spectacular effect. Heavier firepower is provided by such armaments as doomsday weapons or variants of the fearsome death ray. Doomsday weapons are plasma-based and possess incredible destructive potential. They are so power-hungry that entire platforms have been developed to facilitate their deployment. Death rays, imaginatively named, meanwhile pour immense energies through a focusing crystal, unleashing a sustained beam of blinding, searing heat and light that carves through targets one after another. While the Necrons typically favour overwhelming ranged firepower as a statement of contempt for the foe, the close-quarter weapons borne by the more elite or more murderous warriors are no less deadly. Hyperphase weaponry vibrates across multiple dimensional states, allowing it to pass through a target's defences without resistance. Void blades work in a similar fashion, but cause their victims' very molecular bonds to collapse at the slightest touch. Some weapons are as much status symbols as they are potent tools of destruction. The Staff of Light serves both as an energised battle scepter and a fearsome short-ranged energy weapon. War scythes, typically carried only by Necron nobility or their Lich Guard protectors, project ethereal energy fields around their tremendously heavy blades. Each swing carves through even the toughest target as though they were not there. The Cryptex do not restrict themselves to offensive technologies. Their skills extend to the creation and maintenance of countless other strange devices, all of which benefit the Necron legions on the battlefield. One such technology is quantum shielding. Harnessing the strength of incoming attacks, quantum shields transform that power into harmless equivalent energy. They actually become more effective the stronger the enemy's weaponry. Scarcely less of a bulwark is the Dispersion Shield, borne by retinues of Lichgard, towering and heavy. It includes layered energy shield generators that not only stop incoming projectiles, but sometimes ricochet them straight back at the foe. Teleportation technologies are much seen among Necron armies, typically employing captive wormholes that allow their phalanxes to march straight into battle from the depths of their tombs, or even from the surfaces of far distant worlds. The eternity gates of the monolith can even be reversed to create a portal of exile that drags in screaming foes, jettisoning them into a purgatorial nothingness beyond reality itself. Coupled with gravetic repulsion generators, 
which enable anything from infantry to massive war engines to glide smoothly through the air at considerable speeds, it is not hard to see why Necron armies are far more strategically agile than their warriors' rigid gates would suggest. Technology has also allowed the Necrons to enslave other entities to their will. Some of these are brought into being specifically to serve the needs of their creators, while others were subjugated for all eternity for their crimes against the Necron race. Kineptic constructs proliferate through Necron tomb complexes and armies both. Some are large and powerful, such as the Kineptic Doomstalkers that guard their master's armories, or the Kineptic Spiders that command and control scarabs and other lesser drones. Others have stranger functions, such as the ghostly Kineptic Wraiths, employed to repair inaccessible systems within tomb complexes, or the Kineptic Plasmacytes, that isolate and siphon off corrupted engrams from the sleepers within stasis crypts. These latter have been co-opted by the deranged warriors of the Destroyer cults, who actually seek to have some engrammatic patterns injected into themselves so as to further degrade their former personalities and fuel their nihilistic butchery. Regardless, no kineptic being is truly sentient. Rather, they are all artificial slaves, utterly incapable of independent thought. The Kitan shards suffer a far worse fate, for they were once the star gods of near limitless power who tricked the Necron tear into bartering away their souls. Zarek's revenge upon these beings saw them shattered by weapons that employed incredible cosmic energies. Yet the Kitan were bound to reality itself, so could never be destroyed, only splintered into stunted echoes of their former might. Each such shard is still terrifyingly powerful, however, and so the Necrons bound them into extra-dimensional prisons known as Tesseract Labyrinths. When deploying Katarn as weapons upon the battlefield, the Cryptex ensure they are technologically shackled, leashed like mindless beasts and forced to do their master's bidding. Of course, once in a while, a Katarn breaks its straining fetters. At such times, a devastating retribution is visited upon the Necrons and their foes alike. Beyond a simple armoured toughness, the Necrons also benefit from a technology known as living metal. This substance can alter its molecular state in a semi-sentient fashion, flowing and replicating to heal battle damage as fast as it has been inflicted. Just as disturbing to see are the Necrons' reanimation protocols. Should one of their soldiery be felled in battle, a flickering nimbus of crawling energy slowly draws the fallen combatants' twitching components back together. Even utterly shattered Necrons can reassemble themselves, rising to shamble back into the fight. Those two, sorely damaged even for this, are known to vanish in flares of light, either recalled to their stasis crypts for extensive repair, or destroyed by failsafe systems to prevent their bodies from being seized for study by the foe. Certain technological wonders exist that can accelerate or augment these core regenerative processes. The resurrection orbs carried by some high-ranking Necron nobles, for instance, send out a pulse of radiation that temporarily supercharges the self-repair systems of nearby Necron soldiery. Meanwhile, devices such as the Phylactery, or the ghostly beam of the kineptic reanimator, uh, contains swarms of uh, nanoscarabs that rapidly re knit sundered necron bodies and machinery down to the finest and most minute level. Lastly, there are the kineptic spiders and scarabs. The former use raw energy to fabricate swarms of the latter, which in turn are capable of converting all solid matter into further stores of raw energy from which their cryptic masters can fashion anything, from war engines and defences to mighty structures. Given time, this cyclical system can entirely break down the transitory settlements of the lesser races and raise glorious new tomb complexes in their place. The armies of the Imperium have encountered Necron tomb worlds from one edge of known space to the other. Even still, 
Humanity has discovered but a fragment of the dynastic territories into which the galaxy was once divided. The Necrons' worlds are scattered now, many isolated or beset, yet every single one is a mighty stronghold in its own right. None but the Necrons now remember the glory of their star-spanning dynasties from before the Great Sleep. Yet there is little doubt that their holdings have been much abused and eroded in the sixty million years since. When the Silent King ordered his people into their millennial torpor, he did everything he could to protect them. The Necron cities were converted specifically for the purposes of sustaining and protecting their inhabitants as they slept through the ages. They could not have been better defended or more technologically prepared for their ordeal. Still, the fundamental forces of the galaxy resist stagnation, and the Aeons have not been kind. Some tomb worlds were exposed to cosmic phenomena of overwhelming power, be they the explosive deaths of stars, the thunderous impact of huge asteroids, or even the insidious touch of empiric overspill. Plunged into frozen darkness, scorched to bone-dry deserts, irradiated, wrenched and torn apart by gravetic forces, and blanketed in energy storms, these fates and many besides beset tomb worlds and left them inimical to organic life. Of course, such conditions were of little consequence to the Necrons, whose android bodies required none of the fundamentals that flesh and blood creatures did. Indeed, dynasties such as the Nefrek or the Thokt even harnessed and benefited from such deadly conditions. Other tomb worlds have known the expansion of teeming biospheres. Some remain verdant even after the tomb below awakens, the Necron nobility considering the organic flora and fauna a useful camouflage for their fortifications. More often, especially in the case of tomb worlds settled by sentient species, the Necrons swiftly conquer and harvest all that they find on the planet's surface. The awakening legions emerge to find anything from seas of crops to bustling quarries, towering fortifications to sprawling cityscapes, or furious war zones where the lesser races tear at one another, unaware of the doom that conflict has awoken from beneath their feet. Whatever a tomb world's nature or conditions, once the sleepers arise, its fate is irrevocably altered. Land masses shudder and huge subterranean tomb cities stir beneath the surface. Vast structures force their way upward, sloughing off the devastated remains of more youthful civilizations amidst eruptions of magma and seething energy storms. Eerie megastructures ascend into the heavens, ominous guardians uh, taking up watchful stations above the planet as cosmic superweapons flare to life in their flanks. When the command is given by Noble or Cryptek, swarms of canoptic constructs sweep across the globe, devouring and recycling the works of younger races in order to raise monolithic monuments to their arisen masters. Any trace of the intervening millennia is swept away as the Necrons resume rulership of their domains of old. Before the Great Sleep, the worlds of each Necron dynasty were ordered and designated according to strict hierarchical systems. Planets were qualified as crown worlds, core worlds or fringe worlds, with each title bearing significant connotations. At the heart of each dynasty lay its crown world, where the ruling Pharaon sat upon their throne. Crown worlds were as heavily fortified as they were regally magnificent, many playing host to incredible megastructures and devices or weapons of godlike power. Each dynasty's resources flowed in towards its crown world, ensuring its legions were the finest and mightiest, as befitted the personal soldiery of the Pharaon himself. Core worlds made up the inner planets of each dynasty, typically ruled by prominent overlords. They were centres for military might and architectural grandeur that bespoke their dynasty's power. Then there were fringe worlds, those planets furthest from the light of the crown world and thus considered of least import. Fringe worlds were little more than resource-gathering centres and border fortresses, and as such, their rule was given over to each dynasty's lesser Necron lords. 
However, once there was order, now there is chaos. Galactic drift and stellar catastrophe has wrought mayhem amidst the once ordered Necron dynasties. There is much confusion amongst the awakening nobility, but also opportunity for those able to seize it. Some crown worlds have been shorn of their vassal worlds and are forced to fall back upon their own means. In other cases, fringe worlds roused to find their former betters annihilated. In such cases, one-time lords name themselves pharaons and seize control of all the resources and dynastic might they consider their due. Some tomb worlds awaken to bounties of war materials, and those able to conquer pre-existing advanced civilizations revel in the bloody harvest. Then there are those worlds that awaken to madness. Some lie within the bounds of roiling warp storms and must fend off constant demonic assault. Others wake even as they are being overrun by superior enemy forces. Their nobility afforded just enough time to comprehend the horror of their fate before it is sealed. Worst of all, though, are the severed worlds, planets where failures in revivification have left the Necrons as mindless shells, puppeted in a hollow parody of existence by master programs that can never relinquish control to their damned masters. As more and more Necrons awaken, and as their armies of conquest push ever outward, so the galactic territories they control expand. Yet the dynasties are fractured, their strength scattered, and their leaders are likely to fall upon one another's armies as to ally against the common foe. Though their nobility refuse to countenance the truth, or in many cases are ingrammatically incapable of doing so, the likelihood of Necron galactic dominance has, for long millennia, been virtually nil. The return of Zarak, last of the Silent Kings, to the galaxy may change all of this, however. At the same time, and in response to the opening of the Great Rift, anti-chaos protocols have released a long-imprisoned sect of cryptex known as the Technomandrites. It was the command of the Silent King himself that saw these beings interred, for their sheer brilliance eclipsed that of all their rivals, and, by forming a single unified guild, they risked becoming a power block that could eclipse the Triarchs themselves. Yet now Zarak seeks to implement a plan so vast in scope and ambition and scale that he has chosen to treat with the Technomandrites and attempt to win their favour. In the case of many, though by no means all, he has succeeded, for the Silent King's scheme is a masterstroke. By employing arrays of immense, negatively polarised noctilith pylons, he seeks to create zones that humanity, in their dawning terror and ignorance, have christened Pariah Nexus. Each of these regions span interstellar gulfs, their malign energies radiating out through the webs of pylons from one world to the next, and blanketing swathes of the galaxy in a shroud of soul-crushing energies. Where the Cyclopean pylons rise to the skies, entire regions of real space are cut off from the warp, as though by a fractured wall of glass. Though the effect is not absolute, warp travel and translation, astropathic messaging and the manifestation of demonic or psychic energies become vastly more difficult. Should the scattered nexus sites extend until their fields merge, Zarak believes that the threat of chaos could be defeated forevermore. Yet this is but one goal of his insidious plan, for the absolute absence of empiric energies would prove as detrimental to the lesser races as does its current ferocious excess. Living beings within the Pariah Nexus find themselves afflicted with a numbing despair that worsens over time, until eventually they slip into a fugue state and thence into irreversible soul death. This fate leaves their physical forms mindless yet still alive, the perfect vessel for experimentation into the reversal of biotransference. Through this grand scheme, and with the Technomandrite's aid, the last Silent King seeks to provide his people with the means to reverse the damnation he brought upon them, and in doing so, unite the Necrons that they might defeat those foes that endure to reclaim the galaxy at last. 
Every Necron world is organised to strict dynastic codes, from the glittering nobility who rule to the mighty legions that march out to enforce their master's wills. Rare indeed is the tomb world that breaks from this rigid martial order. Every tomb world is governed by its ruling noble, be they Pharon, Overlord or Lord. These rulers are surrounded by their royal court, an assemblage of lesser nobles, Nemesaurs, who command the royal legions, royal wardens, who serve as lieutenants and bodyguards, menacing retinue of lich guard, and scheming knots of cryptic viziers. Much politicking and intrigue goes on in these courts, for most Necrons, who retain personalities after biotransference, remain both ambitious and ruthless. Most Necron rulers find the best way to promote unity amongst their vassals is to set them against a common foe. When the legions march to war, these determined and knowledgeable leaders become valuable assets to their liege lords. Lesser nobles make regal battlefield commanders, royal wardens act as lieutenants, vargards, or even diplomatic envoys, while cryptex keep the dynastic legions on the march and unleash their strange crypto sciences to cripple the enemy and aid their own forces. Another factor uh, keeps the Necron nobility in order, both on and off the battlefield. The Triarch Praetorians, hands of the Silent King, stand as arbiters of the ancient dynastic codes, apart from the structures of the tomb worlds. The Praetorians possess the Triarch-given right to pass judgment upon the honour and conduct of all, even ruling Pharaons. Normally, though, they restrict themselves to the battlefield, where they hang suspended by their gravity displacement packs as battle commences. From their vantage point, they assess the conduct of the foe. In rare cases, they may deem an enemy truly sentient, and thus deserving of the ancient codes of honour. In such circumstances, frustrated Necron nobles find themselves forbidden from deploying dishonourable assets such as death marks, hex mark destroyers and flayed ones. More often than not, however, they deem the enemy little better than vermin and descend to join in their extermination. Most Necron legions are built around a core of phalanx upon phalanx of Necron warriors. Neurally stunted and grindingly obedient, warriors are spent freely by their uncaring masters. Most nobles are more concerned that their warriors' adornments display their leader's status than they are with keeping these peons safe from enemy attacks. The warrior phalanxes require constant direction. Without this, they can manage little more than to hold position and shoot at nearby foes. Properly directed, however, their firepower and resilience make warrior phalanxes ideal for pinning the enemy in place, and grinding them into dust or blunting their most furious counter-offensives. Most Necron legions supplement their warrior phalanxes with formations of more elite and substantially more self-aware soldiery. From bands of tough and tactically independent immortals to sharp-shooting deathmark assassins and hurtling swarms of tomb-blade attack speeders, the dynasties can draw upon a range of strategically specialised military assets to lend their legions the edge in battle. Necron nobles make no secret of the fact that they consider the vehicles of their capacious armories to be more precious than the Necrons who pilot them, or indeed the foot soldiers who march in battle in the war engine's shadows. The Necrons are a people who have always equated their vast technological superiority with an undeniable right to dominate. Every cosmically powered weapon and reality warping engine it's a statement that the Pharaons possess the power to trammel stars and shatter gods. Thus is the armory of each tomb world not only a concentrated display of each ruler's martial might, wealth and status, but also a material manifestation of their right as a supreme being to create and destroy whatever and however they see fit. Some elements of their armies are held in contempt by Necron nobles, such as the kineptic slave constructs or Catan shards that are imprisoned as weapons or power sources. Yet there are other sects in Necron society that take to the battlefield alongside the legions, but who the nobility have little, if any, command over. Foremost amongst these are the destroyer cults. 
While many strains of insanity have afflicted the Necrons, the nihilistic murder madness of destroyers has proven pernicious and increasingly widespread. Destroyers eschew all notion of personal ambition, desire or hope. Instead, descending into a pit of cold and calculated hatred that sees them seek the eradication of all organic life. There are many subcults, from the Lockhust with their grav-sled bodies and heavy firepower, to the blade-armed Scorpec, or the debased subterranean Ophridean, that share one common demand of the Cryptex, which is to have their bodies altered into whatever form they believe optimal for the slaughter of all living things. The Necron nobles employ destroyers as shock troops, however they do not trust them, not only do many fear the destroyer's madness to be infectious, but they wonder whom they will turn upon when all organic victims are slain. The flayed ones, too, are feared and reviled by the rest of Necron society. Exiled to languish in the horrific nether realm known as the Bone Kingdom of Drazak, they are afflicted with the hideous death curse of the Catan known as Landogur, the Flayer. Uh, twisted in body and mind, flayed ones are drawn to the scent of blood, scissoring open the flesh of reality and spilling through from their ghastly realm to fall upon the Necron's foes. The dynastic legions make every effort to avoid these beings, whose madness they fear as catching, but they do little to stop the flayed ones from joining battles that are already underway. The following are some of the more uh, prominent Necron dynasties in existence. The Zarakan dynasty. If this dynasty was once known by a different name, Biotransference or the mental command of Zarak himself erased it from memory. Those of the Zarakan dynasty know only that it was from their number that the last silent king arose, and that by his word, they are to be considered preeminent. But with Zarak's command protocols gone, many of their rival dynasties are less convinced. The Zarakan dynasty were comparatively slow to wake. Their worlds had been scattered by galactic catastrophes, the greatest of which was the onset of warp storm Asmodur in M18. Many of their tomb world complexes had been destroyed whether by natural disaster or the vengeful attentions of the Eldar, who had sought out Zarakan worlds with particular venom. Nor were the Eldar their only foes from ancient days. With Zarakan's command protocol severed, many dynasties awoke with a burning resentment towards the Zarakan. Who were they to have set themselves above all? Some nobles asked. Others blamed them for every horror of the war in heaven, holding them to account for the perceived misdeeds of their absent leader. More than one rival dynasty acted violently upon such feelings, and, between this hostile attention and that of the lesser races, it is a testament to the Zarakan dynasty's skill in strategy and martial artifice that they survived at all. Yet survive they did, beset upon all sides but haughty in their sense of superiority. Their nobles believed, with the fervour of prophecy, that the Silent King would return and reward their loyalty. Many amongst the rival dynasties feared this might prove true. If the Zarakan were undeserving, they asked, why then did the Triarch Praetorians ally themselves so readily to their cause, often fighting in the Zarakan defence, even against other Necrons? And why did their cryptex evince skills in the crafting of weapons, armoured bodies and potent war engines more formidable than those of any other dynasty? It was not simply that they recruited the most skilled cryptex, nor only that the revivification and repair facilities deep within the Zarakan tombs operated with the greatest finesse and efficiency. No, this was something deeply buried in the Necron's artificial psyches, something that manifested in an almost supernatural fashion, so that even lesser dynasties, subsumed into the Zarakan totality, soon exhibited these same traits. Was it some final blessing, bestowed by the Silent King, to ensure that his people would always endure? This, at least, was the Zarakan Pharaon's claim. Now that Zarak has returned, his dynasty hold themselves vindicated, 
revealing ancient treasures and monstrous superweapons long hoarded against this day, the Zarakan enclaves push rapidly outward, launching countless attacks to draw enemies away from the sites where the Silent King is raising his contra empiric matrix. Many smaller dynasties have already flocked to ally themselves with, or else been willingly absorbed into, the Zarakan ranks. After all, any who resist effectively declare themselves opposed to the will of the Silent King. In such an age of chaos and misrule, there are many Necron nobles who would surrender much to feel the unity and validation of a tyrant's hand upon their shoulder once again, and more who fear the consequences should they refuse. The Satuka Dynasty, Legions of the Storm Lord. The Satuka Dynasty has long been the most numerous and aggressively expansionist of all Necron dynasties, Indeed, many of the Necron's foes could be forgiven for their mistaken belief that the colours of the Satuka dynasty are in fact the unified military panoply of the Necron race as a whole. It is their legions, after all, that have assailed the lesser races the most often. The crown world of the Sutek dynasty is known as Mandragora the Golden, and it is the embodiment of the Sutek themselves so peculiarly grim in its macabre magnificence and fortified on a scale that makes the notion of invasion seem a dark jest. Mandragora is a centre for military power, unimaginable riches and the singular obsession of ultimate galactic conquest. This is but one world of the Suteka dynasty, however. In the centuries since the first tomb world complexes awoke, this dynasty has claimed hundreds more though Mandragora is undoubtedly their greatest. The dynasty's legions march tirelessly. The dynasty's entire focus bent upon marshalling ever more armies, raising ever more fleets and sweeping out through the stars to conquer ever more territories in the name of their pharaoh, Imhotek, the Storm Lord. It is from Imhotek himself that this relentless militaristic bent flows, formerly a famed Nemesaur, for those he saw as his superiors, Imhotek claimed the throne from those same nobles when they proved unable to set aside their own petty squabbles. From that day onwards, the Storm Lord shaped the destiny of his awakening dynasty, focusing their every effort towards unifying the Necrons and ensuring their dominance over the upstart lesser races. The dynasty does not restrict its conquest to the worlds of other species. Imhotek's legions have swept over numerous dynastic territories during their relentless expansion. Those who offer ready allegiance are swiftly subsumed into the dynasty, often accorded substantial honour for their willingness to accept unity over personal pride. Those dynasties that resist are subjected to the full might of its legions, albeit they are usually accorded the dynastic codes of honour. Once humbled, they are absorbed all the same, though in a far more brutal fashion than capitulation would have earned. The results of this unending conquest are that the legions are immensely numerous and their arsenals replete with mighty war engines. When Imhotek stretches out his living metal talons, he can darken the skies with invasion craft, unleash the fires of thousands of massed war engines, and send infantry phalanxes beyond number to crush his foes. While the territory held by the dynasty does not yet rival that of many lesser races, still it is an immense swathe of systems for a few centuries' conquests. If Imhotek's advances continue, there is no telling how vast the empire may one day become. The Mefrit Dynasty, the Solar Executioners. The Mefrit Dynasty are famous for their destructive excesses. In the time before the Great Sleep, they were the planetary headsmen of the Silent Kings, employing incredible star-killing weaponry to exterminate entire systems. Once, civilizations all across the galaxy knew to dread the Mefrite Dynasty. When an example needed to be made or a redoubtable opponent shattered, it was they who executed the deed. Employing space-borne weaponry of incalculable power, the Mephrite mercilessly slew the stars that gave enemy systems life, 
leaving their foes frozen in the void or annihilated in seething storms of stellar fire. Many of the other Necron dynasties found such conduct dishonourable and distasteful. Few lauded the Mephrite for their deeds, despite the fact that countless interstellar campaigns were swiftly and decisively concluded in this way. Their peers might have scorned their methods, but none would have been foolish enough to court the Mephrite dynasty's displeasure. In the end, the Mephrite themselves were satisfied that to be feared was an even greater boon than to be accorded honour and respect. The millennia have not been kind to the dynasty, however. Though many of their tomb worlds survived intact, the dynasty's pharaoh, Kyrek the Eternal, was slain by pernicious Eldar infiltrators while he still slumbered. Worse still, the Mephrites have awoken to find their grand weapons of solar execution lost or destroyed by the violent caprice of an uncaring galaxy. Rule of the Mephrite dynasty is now hotly contended for. Ambitious nobles such as Zarathusa, the Ineffable, Eknothet, the Glorious, and Anubitar of the Thousand Victories strive to outmaneuver one another, proving their superiority through military victories and the deeds of grandeur. In truth, though, the first to reclaim the ability to murder stars will surely reign supreme. It is for this reason that several contenders have now turned to the Technomandrites for aid. Nefrika Dynasty Warriors of the Golden Stars The trinary stars of the Nefrika crown world, I and, provide an overwhelming bounty of solar energy that has benefited this dynasty greatly. In a galaxy of constant war, however, they have been forced to fight in order to keep what is theirs. When the tomb complex, deep beneath the surface of Ayand, stirred to wakefulness, its inhabitants emerged to find that the legions of the Altamor dynasty had laid claim to their world. These rivals had been drawn in part by a desire to enslave the imperial settlers who had long basked in Ayan's solar bounty. However, the Altamor had also sought to harness the energies of the trinary stars for their own military use. The Nefrika Feron, Sylfek, wasted no time in fighting back. The great sleep had corrupted Sylfek's personality engrams and left him not just appreciative of his crown world's neighbouring stars, but completely obsessed by them. He was incensed by what he saw as the desecration of his dynasty's sacred rites. The campaign for retribution that he led was lightning swift and ferocious, soon driving the Altamoya Necrons and Imperial forces alike from the system. Since that day, the Nefrika have basked in the light of their stars, Harnessing these energies has allowed them to amass arsenals of doomsday weaponry and other potent technologies with which to blast their foes to ashes. Salfek's obsessions have also played their part, for his desire to be draped in the molten glory of his stars led his dynasty's cryptex to fashion him skin of living metagold that, uh, through advanced hyperial chemical processes, allow him to transform into pure light and cross incredible distances in an eye blink. Believing himself a celestial deity, Sylfek has since bestowed his golden form upon his most trusted overlords and other lieutenants, and has even had the technology worked into the burnished bodies of his lesser soldiery. Now the Grand Legions of the Nefrek dynasty advance in gilded magnificence, stuttering and blinking across the battlefield with terrifying speed. The Nihilek Dynasty, destined for conquest. The Nihilek Dynasty have garnered a fearsome reputation amongst the galaxy's younger races since their worlds began to awaken. Though often steady and defensive, they are nonetheless ruthless conquerors and deadly foes. As they began to rise from their great sleep, the Nihilek discovered that much of their ancient territory had been invaded. Faced with the very real danger of being overrun, their surviving nobility consolidated the dynasty's strength upon their crown world of Geddon. This proved a wise move indeed. The Nihilek 
had always been a tremendously rich dynasty and had funneled much of their vast resource wealth into Geddon's hyperspatial vaults. Now they drew upon their hoard to fashion legion upon legion of war engines, raise mighty defences and equip their warriors with the finest weaponry imaginable. The lesser races hurled their armies against the newly fortified borders of the Nihilek dynasty and were rebuffed with devastating casualties. Moreover, once attacked, the arrogant and imperious Nihilek nobles would not rest until the perceived impudence of their attackers had been punished with utter annihilation. The well-appointed Nihilek legions had another advantage in this war for survival. A greatest of the dynasty's cosmic treasures was the preserved head of the Yith Seer, the last of its race, and a means by which the Necrons could peer into the schemes of the future. Armed with such prescient intelligence, the Nihilek struck precisely where and when they needed to in order to crush any interlopers, transforming their defensive stance into a more offensive march of conquest. Now the Nihilek legions are on the march, and seizing and heavily fortifying new territories with noctilith pylons before advancing again. They have openly aligned themselves with the returned Silent King, and seek nothing short of galactic dominance for their people. The Novok Dynasty Blood-Spattered Butchers Before biotransference, the Novok Dynasty was infamous for its long and elaborate blood rituals and for the naked savagery of its armies. Though unrecognisable as those hosts from prehistory, their legion retains this bloodlust. Few Necron legions are as frightening to face in battle as those of the Novok dynasty. It is one thing to witness flesh and blood warriors slashing a path through their foes, but to see glassy-eyed androids moving from methodical mechanical killing to ever more frenzied industrial slaughter is another scale of horror entirely. The Novok offer no quarter, no mercy for their victims, Instead, they hack them apart like lunatic butchers set loose in a pen of livestock. They do not stop killing until their living metal bodies are drenched in gore and their victims are gnawed but dismembered meat. The reason for this gruesome spectacle is that the memories of their dynasty's blood rituals still linger in the personality engrams of the Novok Necrons. Though they can be ponderous, almost somnolent, before a battle's commencement, once their enemy's blood starts to flow, those engrams are triggered. They provide the Novok soldiery with surges of vigour and aggression that prove near narcotic, while enlivening the blood-spattered Necrons to an ever more dangerous degree. Taking full advantage of this trait, the Novok nobility field vast numbers of infantry assets headed by bands of blade-wielding Lich Guard. These they augment many would say recklessly, with those of their dynasty who have fallen to the destroyer curse. Such a force possesses numbers and resilience, yet its true might is revealed once its gestalt bloodlust awakens and the butchery begins. Employing these tactics, the Novok Feron, Galmech the Moon Killer, has driven his legions relentlessly outwards from his crown world of Dol Four. In one gory conquest after another, they have crushed greenskins and humans alike and show no sign of slowing. Myriad Dynasties The war in heaven took its toll upon the Necron dynasties, annihilating many entirely. Time has seen more still eradicated as tomb complexes have slipped into true and abiding death. Still, a vast number of dynasties remain, each with their own tomb worlds, unique heraldry, and cultural and military predispositions. Indeed, there are far more dynasties abroad amongst the stars than even humanity's darkest nightmares would envision. The shifting void rifts of the Hierarchy Deeps hide the core worlds of the Thokt dynasty, which orbit the massive crown world of Maghoshta in a stately dance across the eons. Smaller, Heavily weaponized planetoids orbit them in turn. Reeved in sparking cerulean energy, the crystalline continent tombs of the Thokt dynasty feed upon the radioactive power of the void rifts that surround them, 
the sky overhead thick with rippling darkness and flickering blue comets. As their armies emerge from their stasis crypts and march to war, dull metal skulls reflect the cold sapphire stars far above. Though far from the largest or most prolific, the Thoct dynasty is arguably one of the most dangerous upon the field of battle due to its lethal and insidious weaponry. Harnessing the potent radiation in which its worlds bask, the Thought Cryptex have incorporated rad receptors into the weaponry of their soldiers. This advancement gives its legions an eerie aspect, causing a shimmering azure glow to radiate from them in waves. It is far more than an aesthetic modification, of course. The multispectral radiation that rolls off the metallic bodies of their soldiery is debilitating in the extreme to their foes. The icy lethality of the Hiraki deeps leave the foe weakened and in agony, easy prey for the merciless legions of the Thoct. The Nakast dynasty have always been synonymous with dubious and dishonourable conduct. Rarely did they adhere to the dynastic codes, for they sought always to employ the most expedient means of victory even if that came by duplicity, misinformation or assassination. So disenchanted did the Triarch become at the conduct of the dynasty that during the reign of Feron Oblis the Enslaver, they denied the dynasty aid when its crown world of Mobius came under furious orc attack. The devastation wrought by the Greenskins was terrible but not total. Though they lost much, the dynasty survived as a jaded and hateful presence. They replaced their former magnificence with harsh, blackened, copper carapaces and turned their backs upon the wider Necron race. They now employ any means necessary to protect their domains, no matter how ruthless or contemptible, and spit redly upon the so-called great dream of galactic Necron rule. The Ogdebek dynasty, in comparison, benefited greatly from their own rather deviant practices. An unusual pact, believed to have been forged shortly after biotransference, saw the nobility and cryptex of their dynasty accorded equal status. Ogdebek armies were occasionally even led by conclaves of cryptex, and were always well served by efficient kinetic swarms and magnificent war engines. Over time, however, the cryptex of the Ogdebek dynasty became arrogant, while their pharaon, Anothrosis of the Black Star, became ever more paranoid that his upstart viziers would one day try to take power for themselves. As the Great Sleep approached, Anothrosis insisted upon veritable armies of kinetic constructs, slave to his own will alone, that could restore his legion swiftly to glory should they be compromised. He saw to it that his tomb complexes were built with triple-layered backup systems, each element built by rival cryptic conclaves guaranteed not to collude, and again exclusively bound to Anathrosis's command. All this additional security proved to be of immense value during the Great Sleep, when the dynasties awoke, the vehicles, constructs and warriors of the Ogdebek emerged from their tombs all but intact, though its leader remains paranoid and its cryptex are still troublesome, the dynasty has conquered great swathes of territory ever since. So many fragmented or comparatively minor dynasties are there that even the returned silent king does not know of them all. Some, though, are infamous amongst the Necrons, either for their methods or their turbulent histories. The Charnavok dynasty, for example, were ravaged by the coming of the Tyranid Hive fleets, and now cling defiantly to the edges of the eastern fringe. Though they have lost much, this means that only their strongest and most determined nobles and legions have survived. Setting aside any notion of politicking, the elite armies of the Charnavok now fight with cold fury to reclaim what they have lost. Needless to say, they have proven willing subjects for Zarak since his return, for they know that ultimately he alone recognises the dire threat that the Tyranids represent. 
The Oriskar dynasty, by comparison, possesses plentiful military power. They are cautious and defensive, however, for they guard a treasure of inestimable power and must be ever ready to defend it. Deep beneath the surface of their crown world Thanatos lies the celestial orrery, a perfect replica of the entire living galaxy wrought in precise metals, shimmering energy and irreplaceable cosmic technology. As the galaxy changes, so the orrery shifts in real time to reflect this, and hundreds of Oriskar technoseers study its every nuance to inform the movements of their legions. More amazingly and terrifying still is that, with the greatest care and precision, the orrery can be used to affect the galaxy in turn, even fashioning black holes or snuffing out stars. Fortunately for the younger races, the Oriskar see themselves as celestial custodians, rarely employing their power unless in greatest need. Others are less cautious, however. The Oriskar Feron Hekmefet currently lies besieged by the xenocidal legions of the Cardenaf dynasty, who wish to unleash the full destructive potential of the Orrery and remain obstinately blind to the ghastly consequences for reality itself should they succeed. The might of the skeletal Necrons is not limited to conventional dynastic legions alone. Bitter outsiders, resentful exiles and malevolent aberrations abound in the wake of the Great Sleep, and many have fashioned Necron armies of their own. Thazar the Invincible, for example, has proven a perilous foe to all who stand before him. After his awakening, the self-styled and highly eccentric pirate king sees the tomb world of Zapanek, having manipulated the world's master program into making him Pharon. Thazar remade Zapanek into Reeve World, building a mighty fleet from drifting wrecks and beginning a campaign of terror against the lesser races. Then there are the haunted legions of Sarkon, crown world of the Empire of the Severed. Long of the Necrons dreaded this awful legion, for here catastrophic radiation storms created a dynasty's worth of isolated worlds. As though such a thing were not bad enough, however, now there are reports of Necron armies issuing from this region in great number. Ethereal after-images are said to dance about their bodies, and they move with such eerie synchronicity that they seem driven by a single godlike will. As yet, reports of these legions falling upon outlying fringe worlds and, by some supernatural process, rendering them severed, remain unsubstantiated. If they are true, however, then the haunted legions represent a terrifying threat to what remains of the Necron's collective souls. The threat of the destroyer legions, meanwhile, is clear. None can say whether it is natural degradation or some strange side effect of the Great Rift's opening, but the madness of the destroyer cult spreads faster through Necron society than ever before. Nobles turn to nihilistic slaughter in alarming numbers, and in a few rare cases, the entire upper echelons of tomb worlds have dedicated themselves and their servile legions to this morbid cause. With the more unscrupulous cryptex helping to fashion new varieties of destroyer all the time, and ghoulish flayed ones flocking to the bloodshed they create, these legions of the lost and the insane carve bloody paths across the galaxy. The following are some of the more well-known, at least to the Imperium, members and leaders of the Necron race. Imhotek, the Stormlord. Imhotek did not awaken from the great sleep as the Pharaon of the Sutaker dynasty. However, compelled by the circumstances and a single-minded determination to reclaim the glorious Necron Empire of old, he took upon himself the mantle and has borne it with confidence and skill ever since. Few who face the Storm Lord survive, and those who do are forever changed. When Imhotek awoke from the great sleep, it was to a world gripped by madness and petty ambition. He soon discovered that even his revivication had occurred not in the name of galactic reconquest, 
but to further the agenda of one amongst Mandragoria's warring rulers. Their former Theron had fallen to the ravages of the Eons, and the more ambitious amongst his royal court had wasted no time in beginning a grinding civil war for the vacant throne. In the hopes of breaking the deadlock, one pretender had ordered the famed Nemesaur Imhotek awakened. Surely this popular war leader would prove the edge required to see the war brought to a swift conclusion. This Imhotek did, though not perhaps in the way his awakener imagined. Disgusted by the petty and short-sighted manoeuvring of the warring nobles, Imhotek rallied an army of his own, and within a year, Said Real had subjected all other contenders for the throne. Imhotek became the undisputed Pharaon of the dynasty, and, with its considerable military resources now his to wield, he began a campaign of rapid expansion that has lasted ever since. Imhotek has consistently displayed a strategic acumen to best the galaxy's greatest war leaders. His strategies could be likened to intricate mechanisms, whose wheels turn across interstellar gulfs and can encompass dozens of worlds and hundreds of armies at a time. To the more organic or superstitious of his enemies, Imhotek's incredible genius has the ring of prescience about it. How could he possibly put in place the multiple layers of contingencies that he does? How could he appear to simply know where his forces will meet victory or defeat? Where the foe will commit reinforcements, and of what sort? How could he employ minute-perfect counter-manoeuvres with precisely weighted forces, often all while coordinating an entirely separate battlefront entire star systems away? The truth lies not in dark sorcery, nor is it, as some hope, a product of inflated rumen and fear-mongering. Rather, Imhotek awoke from his great sleep, possessed of statistical and hyperlogical strategic ability that would burn out the mind of a flesh-and-blood being. Absolute recall of every detail, intense cogitation and logistical processing power, and the ability to perceive with absolute clarity the fractal web of future probabilities, lie at the heart of what Imhotek does. He also grasps, better than most of his race, the psychology of the lesser races. This epithet he earned for his practice of raising vast, dark energy storms that sweep before his armies and engulf those who do battle with him. Communication and coordination collapse beneath the shadow of the storm, and even those few panicked enemies allowed to flee beyond its bounds do so laced with blood-swarm nano-scarabs, these hideous constructs seethe within the bodies of their hosts, sending out a signal that draws the hideous flayed ones to them like hounds on a scent. Only anarchy and illogic can undermine Imhotek's battle plans, and then only for a time. Not without reason does he revile the madness of chaos or the random aggression of the greenskins. This aside... Imhotek does have one other foe who can, on occasion, skew the incredible logic of his schemes. Himself. Something within Imhotek cannot abide a rival, and ever he seeks to confront enemy generals in one-on-one -on -one honour duels. Those he defeats, Imhotek humbles, typically lopping off a hand as a reminder of his greatness before allowing them to withdraw. This strange compulsion uh, is the reason that, as his conquests continue, Imhotek amasses an ever greater list of nemeses who seek his downfall. It may also be the cause of his disdain for the return of the Silent King. Imhotek sees himself as the great uniter of the Necron people, and he has no desire to be eclipsed by the very being whom he holds ultimately accountable for the plight of the Necron race. Trezain the Infinite, the Great Collector. As the archivist of the Solomnus Galleries, Trezain the Infinite's duty is one of preservation. Amidst the war-torn surrounds of the 41st millennium, however, even such a seemingly noble pursuit requires Machiavellian ways and no little flair for violence. Fortunately for the tomb world of Solomnus, Trezain possesses both qualities in abundance. 
Trezine, the infinite, goes into battle not simply to destroy, but also to collect, catalogue and preserve. True, he commands the legions of Salumnus with vicious cunning, but he would argue that he does this in service of goals loftier than military conquest. It is true, also, that his acquisitive drive knows no mercy, and that those who stand between Trezine and his prize are struck down by blows from his empathic obliterator, a weapon that slays not only its immediate victim, but also all those nearby of a like mind and purpose. Yet Trezine would assert that such measures are necessary, even merciful. He holds his mission to be of paramount importance, and, in the time it would take to explain himself to the barbaric lesser races, countless priceless treasures would be forever lost to the flames. After all, to beings as enduring as the Necrons, most civilizations rise and dwindle again in the veritable blink of an eye. How does one explain to such short-lived beings that their only meaningful contribution to the galaxy boils down to a handful of artefacts or individuals, or that they should willingly give these up instead of selfishly clutching to them? Yes, Trezine, the Infinite, appears to his enemies a rapacious monster who attacks without warning or apparent cause and leaves carnage and devastation in his wake. However, in his own mind, he is the most altruistic of all his ancient race. The galleries of Salumnus are grand, almost beyond human imagining. The sunken chambers are crowded with artefacts of all forms, including the fabled reef-bone choir of Altenzar, the preserved head of Sebastian Thor, the ossified husk of an enslaver, and a giant of a man clad in Baroque power armour, his face contorted in a permanent scream. Most significant of all Salomnus's treasures are its prismatic galleries themselves, winding chambers of statuary that recapture events Trezine deems worthy of preservation. The death of Lord Solar Macarius stands near to Doom Rider's folly. Only chambers away from such wonders as the sword both stolen and sought, the last questions of Historicus Ostolan Varus, and the last stand of Urusaka Creed. These scenes are not fabrications. Trezine snatches true historical moments up wholesale, transmuting their inhabitants into hard light holograms that will forever stand testament to their deeds. It is Trezine's greatest regret that nothing lasts forever. More often than he would like to admit, parts of his collection are destroyed by structural damage, kineptic mishandling or damage caused by hostile invaders. At such times he is forced to pause in his works, assemble his legions and strike out into the galaxy to harvest whatever replacements he requires. Trezine is more concerned with spectacle than accuracy. He is more than happy to replace original participants in his dioramas with beings whose garb, alignment or in extremes even species are wildly historically inaccurate. Trezine has fallen afoul of his own race more than once. His light-fingered proclivities are not reserved only for the worlds of the lesser races. He is forbidden to set foot upon Mandragora, is permitted onto Mobius only if his efforts will directly benefit the Nakthaist dynasty, and has been struck down by outraged enemies and politically motivated assassins many times. Trezine is not known as the infinite for nothing, however. He is cunning enough to work through countless surrogate bodies, leaping to a new lackey should his current inhabited form be destroyed. In this way, he is rarely kept from his duties for long, while his enemies are left howling in frustration at the devious archivist's latest impossible escape. Illuminor Siraz the architect of biotransference. Illuminor Siraz is a merciless monster, a bio-architect and hyper-technological vivisector who seeks to unpick the secrets of life itself. He puts his anatomical knowledge to use both on and off the battlefield, preying upon living specimens to better refine and enhance the Necron form. The Catan might have provided the knowledge for biotransference, 
but it was Siraz who made it a reality. Even then, he saw it as the first of several steps on the path to ultimate evolution, a journey that would end as a creature not of flesh or metal, but as a god of pure energy. Until that day, Siraz is driven to take full advantage of and to labour constantly to improve upon the functionality of his android form. After all, no longer must he sleep nor deal with the thousand frailties and distractions of the flesh. Siraz labours to unravel the mysteries of life, for he fears that he would be a poor sort of god without such secrets at his fingertips. Siraz has been on the brink of understanding for many centuries, yet somehow final comprehension always escapes him. Perhaps there are some concepts in the universe that do not reveal themselves before logic, be those matters of the soul or of the ineffable power of faith. Whatever the reason, such secrets will almost certainly lie forever beyond Siraz's comprehension. This is a truth he will never accept. However, a fact that has of late provided the Silent King with the leverage required to secure Siraz's allegiance. After all, if the Illuminor wrought biotransference, then surely he can reverse the process's effects, and perhaps in doing so, garner the final revelations that he has sought for so long. Siraz haunts the battlefields of the 41st millennium like a ghoul. It requires a constant flow of living subjects, and the most efficient way for him to acquire them is to trade his expertise in exchange for captives. Though Siraz is obsessed with the secrets of life, his aptitude for augmenting the weaponry and bodies of his fellow Necrons is peerless. Siraz's delving into the form and function of so many living creatures has taught him how to augment almost every facet of Necron machinery, a trait seen as distasteful for many of his peers. The dissection of Vusalan Raktoid compound eyes unlocked an improved array for targeting optics, and the molecular disassembling of the chitinous amble hide led the way to more efficient armour configurations, to name but two of many thousands of such advances. Siraz's own body and war gear are augmented with the most refined of his discoveries. His atomic energy manipulator allows him to deconstruct specimens in the heat of battle, while his studies of warp-sensitive active minds have given rise to his Empiric Overcharger, which can shock enemy brains into sudden catastrophic psychic manifestations. It is a matter of some speculation how much involvement Siraz had in the design and implementation of the Pariah Nexus, but none can question that he is taking full advantage of its effects. Hundreds of thousands of stilled beings have already vanished into the Illuminor's horrific laboratories, and his harvest continues apace. Orican the Diviner, Master of Past and Future The single eye of Orican the Diviner pierces the veil of the present to reveal deeper secrets of time, space, and even fate itself. His astromantic powers allow him to inspect the schemes of fate with great clarity and to direct events always toward whatever path will best benefit him. Yet Orican has other powers beside astromancy, powers that may yet make him a god. Long ago, in a time before the Necrons forfeited their souls in exchange for eternal forms of living metal, Orican was the court astrologer to Zarak himself. A skilled diviner even then, Orican read the portents and offered what guidance he could to the court of the last silent king. It is said that he alone spoke out against trusting Mafet Ran, arguing against biotransference right up until it came to pass. Norikan had not forgotten that his warnings were ignored, and has not forgiven Zarak for dismissing his concerns. Since he awoke within a cold body of living metal and realised that all he feared had come to pass, Orican has offered true fealty to no master save himself. There is no other that he now trusts to accord his divinations the weight of respect that they deserve. This is perhaps an unfair judgment on Orican's part, for he has revealed the true extent of his power to no other. 
The diviner himself is only too aware of his own abilities, however, and for years beyond count he has employed them to further a personal agenda, terrifying in both scope and scale. It is true that Orican reads the flow of the cosmos and the auras of the stars, and that with the wisdom he gleams he predicts history's great events with unfailing skill. The Great Crusade, the Horus Heresy, the coming of the Tyranid High Fleets, and the opening of the Great Rift. These and countless other dramas upon the grand galactic stage were revealed to Orican long before they came to pass. With more focus, the Diviner can even read the future of specific campaigns or individual heroes, predicting how events will transpire and selling his knowledge to whichever noble court will find it most valuable, provided, of course, that they can pay Orican's price. This is never anything so prosaic as coin or resources. The Diviner seeks deeds, arcana and gifts of promise. Then he hoards his esoteric riches well. More than this, though, Orican is also a chronomancer of prodigious skill and power. This is the talent he keeps hidden, his greatest secret and most potent weapon. Upon grasping some revelation or spying an opportunity he missed, Orican embarks upon a journey down his own timeline in order to adjust events or provide himself with warning of what is to come. The Diviner must, of course, be cautious. Even the smallest change in causality can have spiralling and unintended consequences. It speaks to Orican's skill and cunning that his temporal interference has never been revealed, barring a few overly curious allies who soon meet with horrible and entirely improbable twists of fate. Even without their knowing the full extent of his powers, most Necron nobles prize Orican's service, if not his attitude in their armies. The Diviner is infamous for his insouciance and wry mockery, which flies in the face of the Triarch's ancient codes and the most basic protocols of the royal courts. Most of Oricon's peers simply believe him to be louche and disrespectful, either because it is in his nature or due to some quirk of his revivication. A few canny souls suspect that the roots of this behaviour lie in his last bitter exchange with Zarak before the Necron's fate was sealed. None, however, suspect the real truth. Orokhan takes to the battlefields of the 41st millennium in furtherance of a subtle agenda, centuries in the making. He manipulates those armies he fights alongside and ensures that his own goals are achieved, pruning and tweaking the galactic timeline as a master horticulturist tends to his garden. Very soon now, Orokhan believes, the stars will come into final alignment, at that moment, the unfettered power of the cosmos will be his to command, and his temporal traps, woven carefully across the galaxy like the fault lines of an earthquake about to strike, will be triggered all at once. When that moment comes, it will be Orokan who becomes the master, and all will be forced to obey his commands. Zandrek and Obiron The time-lost lord and his faithful defender. The title of Nemesaur is a weighty one. Those Necrons who don this mantle assume tremendous military responsibilities. Battlefield commander, high strategist, champion of the dynastic codes, envoy, exemplar, and protector of their dynasty. Though revivication left him quite mad, Nemesaur Zandrak still strives to embody all of these lofty goals. Zandrek is amongst the most famed of Sutek dynasty's nemesaurs. He enjoys the personal favour of Imhotek the Stormlord. Under his rule, the fringe world of Gildrim has risen to prominence as a powerful core world and military hub. He is noble, principled, and as a commander, quite brilliant. Not to mention, loyally defended by his constant shadow, Vargard Obiron. Uh, sadly, Nemesaur Zandrek is also afflicted with a delusional insanity so deeply ingrained there is no chance he will ever recover from it. The Nemesaur perceives the galaxy about him as it once was, long before the horrors of biotransference. 
Zandrek believes himself and his followers to be flesh and blood beings. So convinced of this is he that the Nemesaur still employs several dozen food tasters to watch for poison in the feasts served up to but never consumed by his royal court. Moreover, to Zandrek, the enemies he fights are not rampaging orc hordes, elite space marine strike forces or demon-worshipping cultists. In their place, Zandrek instead sees armed and armoured Necron Terre, servants of rebellious dynasties deluded or deceived by separatist demagogues, but Necron Terre nonetheless. As such, the old Nemesaur records every foe he faces the full extent of his dynastic honour codes. He shuns the use of death marks, flayed ones or destroyers where at all possible, and offers his enemies every chance to surrender or retreat. Zandrek even insists that enemy commanders be captured rather than killed, and afforded every courtesy as respected Necronteer leaders. For all this, Nemesor Zandrek is a sublimely skilled strategist and a masterful battlefield tactician. Still, this might not have been enough to save him from ill-favoured attentions of his mutinous royal court, but that he is protected at all times by Vargard Oberon. Having served as Zandrek's protector since the days of flesh and blood, Oberon is utterly and selflessly loyal to his master. It is Oberon who quietly puts down courtly rebellions on Gidrum, and who disposes of Zandrek's honoured prisoners. He has been reprimanded by his rambling master more than once for the number of fatal accidents that seem to befall such captives. On the battlefield, the hulking Vargard watches over his master with unblinking eyes. True, he is happy to storm into the enemy at the head of Zandrek's legions, where he can butcher the lesser races with savage abandon, but Oberon is always alert to Zandrek's position. Should any foe threaten the Nemesaur's person, Oberon activates his ghost walk mantle and steps through reality to appear at Zandrek's side a heartbeat later. More times than he can count, the Vargard has arrived in time to block an enemy's descending blade, typically eliciting a pleased chuckle from his master, along with bluff instructions to give the spirited attacker a fair fight. Amrakir the Traveller Some see Amrakir as the ultimate expression of Necron's stellar supremacy, an indefatigable warrior whose crusade for unity is nothing short of inspirational. Other Necron nobles see him as a rogue, an opportunist, and a privateer little better than the plundering vermin of the lesser races. Amrakir cares not either way, so long as he is able to continue his quest. Amrakir storms into battle with his war scythe swinging in vicious, decapitating arcs. Should a towering bastion or mighty enemy bar his path, he merely raises his Tycheon arrow, and with a thunderclap that could split a mountain in two, erases his target from existence. Should the foe send war engines against Amrakir, their shocked crews may find themselves suddenly unable to control their vehicle's weapon systems. The Traveller can project his consciousness into the machineries of the lesser races and bend their crude spirits to his will, making heavy cannons and energy blasters swivel suddenly to new targeting coordinates before unleashing punishing salvos that blow the enemy's commanders, elite warriors or accompanying armour assets to smouldering pieces. Nor does Amrakir fight alone, of course. His legions are inveterate campaigners all battle-scarred and deadly. At their heart march the Pyrian Eternals, Necron soldiery that hail from Amrakaya's own crown world, and who have fought at his side for hundreds of years. Few enemies can long withstand the assault of this rarefied cadre, of these Necrons, who are as indomitable and resilient in close quarters as they are at range. What truly makes him remarkable is not his skill in battle, however, prodigious that might be. Instead, it is his ceaseless campaigning and the goals he seeks to achieve. He fights not for the fervourance of his dynasty's greatness at the expense of all others, but rather for the greatness of the Necrons as a whole. Upon awakening from the great sleep, 
He was fortunate enough to find himself hailed and whole, with his faculties intact and his will undimmed. It did not take him long to grasp the true situation that the Necrons found themselves in, scattered, lost and awakening in increments while surrounded by hostile foes. Had the Silent King already declared his return, he would undoubtedly have rallied to his banner as the uniter and saviour of the Necron race. Robbed of such a figurehead, however, he took it upon himself to become one. Thus he became the Traveller, leaving the rule of his crown world in others' hands and taking the vast majority of his military might off into the stars. He vowed to travel from one Necron world to the next, awakening those that still slumbered and defending those that were under attack, until, at last, the Necron dynasties were all fully restored and their race ruled the galaxy again. His self-appointed mission has proven challenging, however, in ways that he did not foresee. For one thing, the maps and charts he possessed are out of date, making it tremendously difficult to locate each world. Even when he does, he often finds the cold, dead ruin of tomb complexes already plundered by the lesser races. At such times, he descends with furious violence upon the transgressors, always hoping that word of such examples will spread and dissuade further trespasses. To his frustration, it never does. As his mission drags ever on, so his ranks are depleted. In order to maintain the momentum of his crusade, the Traveller demands a tithe of military might from every Necron world he encounters, awakens or rescues. Sometimes this is given willingly enough, but on occasion he is accused of extortion and brigandry, and must take his reinforcements by force. Such incidents sadden him, for he cannot understand how all of his race do not share his vision or zeal. However, he pushes on regardless, certain that when at last his quest is complete, all of his race will understand and applaud his vision. The Silent King, Supreme Ruler of the Necron Dynasties Last of the Silent Kings, Shatterer of the Star Gods, Defeater of the Old Ones, Bringer of Unity, Master of the Final Triarch, Wielder of the Sceptre of Eternal Glory, these are but a handful of the grand titles earned by Zarek, the ruler of the Necron race. His endless honorifics paint a glorious picture, but in truth his gleaming image is tainted by an inner darkness few see. Few beings in the galaxy possess the might, wisdom and sweeping vision of Zarek, the last of the Silent Kings. During the nightmarish transition of biotransference, it was Zarek who emerged with the most powerful and advanced of all the bodies gifted to the newly fashioned Necron race. His neurological and sensory architecture, while wholly synthetic, is more advanced and precise than anything flesh and blood could emulate. His powerful android form is mechanical perfection on a level that no sentient being now alive could replicate. Smooth and graceful in its every motion, irresistible in its strength and regal and intimidating in its magnificent presence. Neither mental nor physical ailments can ever afflict the Silent King. His mind remains more wholly his own than any amongst his people, for he was ever their ruler and did not endure the perils of the great sleep or subsequent revivication that have driven so many Necrons mad. For all this, Zarak suffers, as he has suffered ever since he realised the purgatory into which he consigned his people. Millennia have heaped upon millennia, and still the Silent King's guilt remains as jagged and bitter within him as once it was. His sorrow and horror have been preserved by his mechanised mind as perfectly as is every single memory, thought and feeling Zarak has experienced since the days of his biotransference. It can be said with certainty that such an impossible burden as this would have driven even the most resilient of living beings to madness and self-destruction ages ago. The Silent King, though, is not truly living, and his torments have not destroyed him. 
Instead, they have hemmed him into a being of horrifying and singular determination. The Silent King has a plan for his people and for the galaxy, and he knows that he is righteous with the inescapable, unwavering certainty of a god, of a machine. Zarak's will is a star erupting in supernova, a comet colliding with a doomed world. He is as inevitable as time and tide. The Silent King seeks nothing less than final atonement for the fate to which he consigned his race, and none shall be permitted to stand in his way. He was not always so singular in his obsession. When the end of the war in heaven came and the last of the Catan had been shattered, he recognised that his people could not withstand further conflict. The allies and servants of the old ones were circling, weary but vengeful, and so he ordered the great sleep. He envisioned a future where their enemies would be defeated by strife and time. The Necrons would arise unsuspected from their long sleep. They would seize control of the galaxy using their deathless bones and cosmic weapons, and then, freed from conflict and unshackled from the ravages of time and mortality, they would at last devise a way to reverse biotransference and therefore expunge his sins. The Silent King would not share in this process, however. For himself, he chose exile aboard his vast city-sized warship, Song of Oblivion. He took many of his own dynasty with him into the intergalactic void, entombed within stasis crypts of their own, but awakening in regular cycles to crew and garrison his vast ship. None amongst the dynasties truly knows what the Silent King sought beyond the stars. Detractors like Imhotek or Zarathusa, the ineffable, claim he fled with no more intent than to escape his crimes. Others believe he had a greater purpose. Perhaps some speculate. Zarak even sought a cure for biotransference in the lightless realms beyond the galactic rim. Maybe he intended to travel to other galaxies entirely, and there find the solutions to his people's woes. None but he himself knows the truth, and, as with many of the more troubling mysteries surrounding the Silent King, his race find themselves unable to recall whether they themselves ever knew the answer. From which dynasty did he originally hail from? What characterised his rule before biotransference? When precisely did he return to the galaxy? And for how long did he operate from the shadows before openly declaring his return? Even beings like Orican the Diviner, who was once his court astrologer, find strange gaps in their artificial memories concerning such things. More unsettling still, they rarely seem able to focus on these doubts long enough to seek an answer. For all the gaps in recollection that veil elements of his life, at least, his motivation for returning to the galaxy appears straightforward. The Silent King abandoned exile to save his people from the menace of the Tyranids. It is said that he encountered dormant hive fleets flowing through the intergalactic darkness towards the galaxy he had left behind, and recognised the peril they represented. What if they devoured all life before the Necrons could reverse biotransference? Worse, what if his people had already managed their apotheosis just in time to be devoured in turn? Supposedly driven by pure altruism and a desire not to fail his people again, he turned the Song of Oblivion back towards the distant glimmer of the stars he had known so long ago. This story in itself has holes. What did he witness and on what scale? What so convinced him of this omnipresent peril? How did he chance across the encroaching tyranids amidst the near-infinite gulfs of space? Questions of pretext and motivation have been raised, however briefly, by the more rebellious amongst the royal courts, and whispers persist that the Silent King harbours some other deeper agenda. Few find themselves able to sustain their doubts for long, however, and for those who do, the Triarch Praetorians are never far behind. Such shadows and whispers soon burn away in the searing light of his presence. 
it is said that merely meeting the silent king in person is to transform even the keenest doubter into a supplicant desperate to do his will. Shortly after revealing himself openly to his people, he chose two pherons of lesser dynasties who had proven their loyalty through swift service. Subsuming their legions into his ranks, the silent king elevated Hafratra, the radiant and Masafet of the Shadowed Hand, to form his new triarch. They became the Pharaon of the Stars and the Pharaon of the Blades, as the ancient codes dictated. Joining with him upon his mighty dais of dominion, from which they could proclaim the triarch's will. There are those who have noted how thoroughly the two Pharaons are bound into the dais, how their voices have taken on a new tone of command since their ascension, and how they speak nearly always with perfect synchronicity. But of course, elevation to the final triarch was bound to affect changes upon such minor rulers, and if they seem always to support his plans without question, those plans were millennia in the laying, after all. Who could honestly suggest amendments to such a comprehensive scheme? The martial might of the final triarch, at least, is beyond question. His dais is empowered by a caged shard of Niadra Zatha himself, while a silent king's mantle is formed from the Catan's flensed necrodermis. It is the burning one's own fire that he amplifies through his regal scepter of eternal glory, sending it blazing forth in searing beams of absolute destruction. That same energy is channeled into the potent carrier wave generators of the dais that coordinate and motivate nearby Necron soldiery and also into the Noctilif beacons held high above his throne. These beacons not only banish the infernal energies of the warp, but also allow the Silent King to tear open the invisible skeins of the webway, fashioning his own temporary dolmen gates to bear him swiftly across vast interstellar gulfs. Those foes, not erased by his energy blasts, are far from safe. While Hypertha unleashes flurries of neutron bombs, from the Staff of Stars, Massafet hefts the scythe of dust, every swing of its glimmering blade, reducing victims to swirling clouds of scorched particles. Enemies who get close enough to strike at the Silent King directly are forced to their knees by the thrumming energies of the Deus's obeisance generators. Even those blows that manage to hit home are unlikely to do harm, the Silent King and his companions are swathed in a transtemporal field that scatters the force of the foe's attacks and thus dissipates them harmlessly. All the while, a pair of triarchal menhirs orbit the dais, proclaiming the triarch's omnipotent might even as they channel the dais's power. By focusing the resonance of these devices, the Silent King can unleash a devastating annihilator beam an energy weapon so potent that it has been likened to the hurled spear of an enraged god. None who feel its wrath live to tell the tale. And so ends this history of the Necrons. Thanks for watching, everybody. Please do remember to leave a like on the video. Let me know in the comments uh, what you thought. And uh, do subscribe if you're not subscribed and share it to people if you know anyone who might enjoy this. Thank you very much. All those things really, really help the channel grow. Really appreciate it. I'll be back with more stuff soon. Uh, if you would like to support the channel, like these heroes whose names are scrolling past right now do, or have, or do, uh, then please uh, do consider using the links below. I really, really appreciate that. That really helps. And you guys, uh, thank you for all your support. You really help this uh, channel carry on. So I really appreciate that. I'll be back with more stuff soon. Um, I've always been a big fan of the Necrons. I remember getting the White Dwarf when I was young, 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 when it first came out, when they get the free one away, when they first launched the Necrons uh, a long time ago. I've still got that one knocking around somewhere as well, I'm pretty sure, the old metal one. Uh -huh. the, in, the, in the crab stance, ready to shuffle towards you. And I remember the White Dwarf as well, where they had the first battle report. Um, I think I've written that into the lore now as the first 
time the Imperium encountered the Necrons, it's become like law. I think it's Sanctuary 201 or, or something like that. Some Sisters of Battle chapter house gets attacked by Necrons and it's all like mysterious and you know what I mean? It's like the first time and now it's part of the law that that's the first fight between the Imperium and Necrons. So I think that's pretty funny. Anyway, I'll be back soon. Thank you all very much. Uh, yeah, yeah, more stuff coming soon. Thanks very much again. Ta-ra, bye-bye.